Thank you, Mark, my friend of 42 years. <laughs> Appreciate it. It is good to be back here. I was here a year ago, and like Mark said, we did a, uh, a revival then. And it was about the final events. It was about what Revelation has to say about um, what's coming. And I think things are getting crazier all the time. Does anyone see the same thing? It's, it's amazing, really, when you look at how fast things are changing. And so when I was praying about what I, I wanted to speak on uh, this, um, this morning and this weekend, actually, I, and I said this last night, but I'll just give it a quick recap. There's a lot of things that are important to talk about. You've got all the events that Daniel and Revelation tell us are coming. You've got uh, you know, issues about marriage. You've got helping the homeless. You've got you know, the church work and all that. But I thought, you know, what we really need at this time is something that will help people to get more on track with just a simple walk with God. Amen? Amen. Because if you have the walk with God and it's active and, and it's working in your life where you get, you're getting to know him and, and you're, you're in his presence frequently, these other things tend to, to kind of work out, do they not? you are going to want to read the Bible more and find out what the Bible has to say about prophecy and so forth. And so the three areas that we're going to be looking at, we, we started last night with part one of this series called Walking with God in the Final Days, and that was walking with God through the Word. And so part two is right now, we're going to be talking about the idea of walking with God through prayer. And then this afternoon after the potluck, he's, like Mark said, between like 1.30 and 2, somewhere depending on how lunch is going out there, we're going to do part three, which is the idea of sharing with others. And some of you may be good at one of those, not so great at the other two. You need some help. Some may be struggling with only one and, and two of them you feel good, and some you may be having a very effective walk in all these areas, but this will be some, a good refresher, maybe some new ideas because I want to share with you some things that have worked with me, for me. that have helped me to stay with studying the Bible. It has helped my prayer life a lot, and then also with sharing others. And we'll tell a few miracle stories along the way that I've experienced. So, so like I said, this is part two, walking with God through prayer. So we're going to focus on the idea of how to have a prayer life. Now, there's a lot of material out there about this, and I'm going to try to keep it simple, Something that can help you. Last night I talked about how, you know, our, we're on a highway, we're on a freeway, an expressway toward heaven. God wants us to stay on that freeway, the, the, the straight road that gets us there. But we get uh, off ramps in our lives, all these distractions, these things that are so appealing to us, they get us off that expressway and down into the side streets and going the wrong way on a one way street and all the potholes and all the problems. And so what we're going to be looking at is how can we have better on-ramps, more appealing on-ramps that are easier to take and get away from those appealing and alluring off-ramps. And so a thread that I'm weaving through the whole thing is these three letters, CWP. So C is God's character, God's amazing character. The more we know him, the more we love him. Throughout all eternity, we're going to be loving him more and more and more. And so getting to know who God is is going to help us not only in our walk with God now, but also for any of the events that are coming. I have another uh, talk that I did once. If you looked at some of the most, the most pivotal events in this planet's history, spiritually speaking, they had to do with, did the people in that test know God's character or not? Adam and Eve with the tree and the serpent. Did God really say that you couldn't eat of all the trees? Oh, yes, we can eat of the trees, just not this one. And then comes the lies. Oh, look, the serpent's talking, you know. God must have lied to me when he said, don't eat of the tree. He's holding something back. And so it was a misunderstanding of God's character. Same when the flood came, another huge test for humans, right? Same thing when Jesus came to earth and was crucified, another test. And they all had to do with how well we know God's character. The second one is the W, God's will. God's will for my life. I mentioned a book that you might want to check out uh, and purchase. It's an old book. It was written in the late 1700s, early 1800s by a man named Andrew Murray. Some of you know Andrew Murray's work. He's written a lot of books called God's Will, Our Dwelling Place. I highly recommend it. It's a very short book, but uh, it's an easy read, but it gets into this subject. 
And then finally the P, the promises of God. Living on those promises, living by the promises of God and not just by our own whims, but God's promises. And so typically in Christianity, we have people talking about the basic four. And they are prayer, Bible study, sharing the gospel, and fellowship together. Now, I don't focus really in this series on fellowship so much because you're here, and so I figured you got that one down, right? At least today you do. You may not next week. You may not for the rest of the year. But you've got that one down. And, um, but I do want to say a note to those that are streaming, um, watching the live stream. We're glad you're watching it. Um, but if possible, we want, to, we want to see you here. We want to see your face. Uh, COVID did a lot to uh, set back church attendance, did it not? And so it's over. We want to come back, and we need each other. Amen? Amen. I need you, and uh, this may be scary to you, but you need me as well. We all need each other. We need each other. So the question comes up, why walk with God? I mean, what is it? Obviously, it sounds good. We know Enoch walked with God, and other Bible talks about other people, and it uses the phrase walk with God, but Enoch kind of stands out because he was translated. Why do it? Is it, you know, is it just so I'll be saved? So I want to say something that I said last night once again here. We're not going to be getting into the issue of salvation. This is not like a litmus test. So here's all the things you got to do, you know. A lot of times if you're raising kids, they'll, they'll use that on you. So does that mean I'll go to hell if I, if I don't do that thing? Or will I go to hell if I do that thing? I said, well, what a standard. Can you imagine if you said to your spouse, so I'm thinking of doing so-and-so, and they don't like what you're doing, and you say, well, does this mean we'll get a divorce, or am I okay going ahead with it? Because that's as long as we don't get divorced, I really don't care. No, we want to have a walk with God that is because it's fulfilling, amen? That's what we're going to talk about over this series. It's fulfilling. It's the best life. So there are lots of things you'll get from it, but the three that we covered last night, and by the way, um, whether you are... Uh, watching this streaming or here, you can, you can, any of these that got streamed are recorded. So you can go to this church's website and watch last night's, which is part one. And we, we got into these a little bit deeper. I'm just doing a quick recap on some things. But God, God created pleasure and desire. And there's a lot of those things that we can experience whether or not we have a walk with God, right? We can go and look at the sunset and we say, that's beautiful. We can enjoy swimming in a pool, and we can say, that was fun. And we can be an atheist and say, oh, I don't need God, and we, we kind of delude it and think that we, we can have a successful life. But we can experience stimulation and, and, and some of these things. But peace, peace is different. Think about it. Peace is something you cannot get by going out into the world. You cannot get with billions of dollars. You cannot purchase it. In fact, peace is the emotion and the state of mind Really, it's more than an emotion that is the foundation of your entire being. And if you have peace, then everything you build on top of that is real. Happiness, joy, love, fulfillment, uh, contentment, they all fit on there. If you don't have peace, take that away. That's why you see the world piling on just stimulation, right? I need more drugs. I need more traveling. I need more, uh, I need more, you know, sex and wild parties and all, all these kind of things. I, I keep piling those on because I don't have peace. And the difference with peace and any of those other things is God says, this one, I am only going to give to those who come to me and receive it. Unlike so many other things that we go out in life and do, God says, I have a monopoly on peace. If you come to me, I'll give it to you. Jesus, remember, he even said, peace I leave with you. And then he said, not as the world giveth, give I. Not, not that kind of peace, where if you get rich enough, you can rest at night that you don't have to worry about your bills. No, no, no. He says, mine is real. And he says, I will give that to you, but I own it. I have a monopoly, and you can't get it without me. So he'll give you that peace, per perfect peace. That will give him perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, Isaiah 26.3. We talked last night about pleasure. God invented pleasure. Satan has not invented one thing that's pleasurable. He only perverted the existing things. But he, he can't come up with any new ideas that are pleasurable. Even the drugs that we take to, you know, these illicit drugs and so forth, all they're doing is stimulating the drugs that God already put in our heads, the dopamine, the serotonin. Satan didn't invent those things. Satan could not invent anything that you actually find pleasurable. All he can do is pervert and twist the things that God invented. Amen? God is the author of pleasure. And then finally, a more effective life or a prosperous life. 
I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Psalm 1, verses 1 to 4 says that the, the ones who walk with God are those that everything they do will prosper. They'll be like a tree planted by the water. And everything they do, not money necessarily, but success, effectiveness. you got a project. You, you, the Bible says in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Let's say it together. You know it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And then what happens? He shall direct thy path. You believe it? See, God wants us to, to really get back to the idea of faith, where we read something like that, and we say, absolutely, I believe it, and we go out and we do it, instead of, well, that sounds good, but oh, God's not really going to direct my... We need to believe it. We need to believe it, and that's what God can give us. So I want you to think about, in a war situation, the enemy knows that if they can cut off the communication of the other side so they can't communicate with each other, particularly with the backup forces, the ammunition that's coming, the airplanes, the warships, then they can win. Just get to that. Get to the communication. Cut that off. Destroy the communication, and they won. And the Bible talks about the importance of the communication with God. In fact, there's a, there's a quote from a book that I, I really like, that I recommend. It's a small book called Steps to Christ. And, and here's one of the things that we find in that book. The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. Now think about that for a minute. It makes sense because we live in a fallen world. And God is light. And if we're not connecting with God, we're not showing any interest in saying, God, I want to talk to you. I want to listen to you. Then the natural thing is that darkness would enclose over us. It's pretty scary. It's pretty scary. But... On that same page, look at this. I love this quote. Prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse, where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence. Amen? That's the key. Prayer is the key to unlock all of that. So we can either have darkness of the, the enemy encompassing us, or we can have the, the boundless resources of omnipotence. Now, have you ever thought about this? When we, when we talk about prayer and what prayer actually is and our time with God in prayer, can you imagine what would it be like if our friends and family and those around us talked to, to us every day in the same style, not the content, but the style that we talk to God? If we right now did an experiment, right, and you went home and, and something happened, something odd happened where everyone interacts with you identically, to how you interact with God. So, right, we, and every one of us, is that's what happens to us this, this, this week. In some cases, they would all go silent, wouldn't they? <laughs> you would have no visitors, no one would talk to you because you, you aren't having a prayer life, and so if that's reflected in all of them, they would walk right past you. you. You get up in the morning, hey, how are you doing? They'd walk right on past you and go to work. You'd think, what is going on? This is crazy. Others, it would sound something like this. And this, this, this was me for years. If you, if you did this experiment with me, everyone's talking to me like I prayed, it'd be something like this. To, to my wife, it'd be, well, hello, dear. I just want to say I appreciate you. Thank you for all that you've done. I hope you have a good day. Uh, keep me in your thoughts today, and I'll see you this afternoon. Bye. And, and then I would walk out. That would be the extent of my communion with my wife. And I'd come home again. I'd end the day with, thank you for all the things you've done for me. You're a wonderful wife. I love you. Um, it's great that we spent time together. You mean everything in the world to me. Good night. And I'd roll over and go to sleep. Now, think about your conversations with God. Think about those, right? Are you communing with God in a way that one would with someone they have a relationship with? Are you saying it in a way that's really slow and thought out, like you're wanting to know, how, how does God feel about this? Am I being impressed with scriptures that I, I turn to because I'm, I'm laying it all out to God? I'm casting all my cares upon him in a way that's not formulaic. You know, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all you've done. Please help us to have a good day. In Jesus' name, amen. And it becomes rote, right? We, we, it's, we go through it so many times. And God doesn't, God doesn't condemn us. God doesn't say you're a horrible person. God says, I want you to have so much more in this relationship. There's so much more. And that's what I want to do with this particular talk. I want to help you 
If you struggle with prayer, and I know a lot of people do, some people are brand new to a walk with God. They're, they're definitely struggling. But others have had this walk for a long time, and you know who you are, and your prayer life is starting to just sort of fade. And you're finding it you know, harder and harder to keep your mind on God. And the Bible talks about, you know, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. What a thought. You know, you're constantly communing with God. Now, one of the things we look at in all three parts here is Enoch. The fact that Enoch walked with God and he was translated. And the Bible says, you read in the verses that Mark read, he, he pleased God. And it says that, that, those, that those that please God uh, seek after him. They, he sought after God, and he pleased God. And so this is a key here. What is, it, what is God wanting us to do? What pleases God? And in case someone says, well, that was, that was Enoch. Of course he pleased God. He lived in the old days, you know, nothing like our modern world with all the distractions. Yes, uh, but, but that's different for us today. In a book called Our Father Cares, we have this phrase, there are Enochs in this our day. And does the Bible say in Revelation that there will be a group of people, even though the entire world is going to pot, that they actually do have the faith of Jesus and keep the commandments of God? That those are some Enochs right there because the world is going to be very opposed to that. The dragon wroth with the woman and goes to make war with the remnant of her seed. So there are three kinds of prayers. There are more than this really, but there's three basic types, if you, if you want to put them in categories. There's corporate prayer, which we've had here. We've had it here today. When we pray about God, we, you've heard our requests. You pray for the group that's here today and the people that are watching. Second Chronicles chapter 6, Solomon gave an example of that. Then there's private prayer. Matthew 6, 6, Jesus talks about this, and he talks about when you pray in secret, you know, go into your closet or your special place that you go. And that is where that communion with God is. You pour out your heart to him. And you have a, you're having a, a, um, real, a real connection with him as opposed to just this quick, hey, help me have a good day in Jesus' name, amen, type of thing. And then there is the abiding prayer. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, one of the shortest verses in the Bible, it says pray without ceasing. Abiding prayer, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. So we're going to be looking mostly at that second one. Um, some, we'll go some into the third, but mostly the, the private prayer. How many of you have heard of George Mueller? Yes, George Mueller was a great man, lived in the 1800s, and one of the things he was known for was his prayer life and his, and his witnessing. And he has an amazing story when you read about um, George Mueller, you see how many people he brought to the Lord, the miracles that happened because of his prayer life. It's an amazing thing. Look him up and, and read, it, read his biography. But here's something that Mueller said he discovered when it came to his, his prayer time. And this is good. The, the order of this is pretty good. After you, last night, we talked about studying the Word of God. And we talked about having a marking system that helps us to, it comes alive and helps us to remember better. Well, George Mueller, uh, this is from a book by Donald um, Whitney, and he says, Mueller's discovery was that after meditating on Scripture, he was more able to experience a meaningful prayer time. So this is a principle and also a tip for you. If you're going to uh, have time that you set aside for prayer, you might want to start it with opening God's Word. Have the Word, if you're feeding on the Word, and it's going into your mind, and now when you commune with God, that's the mindset that you have. Um, the opposite is true as well. If you're going to do a Bible study with someone, and you're going to open the Word, you want to pray before you have the Bible study. So they, go, they really go hand in hand. There's a book that I uh, have been reading lately. Um, I actually have the audio book. It's called Bored and Brilliant. Bored and Brilliant. Now, what in the world do you think this is about? It's a very strange title, isn't it? And this has nothing to do with the, the church or a spiritual walk. But it has to do with some research that I wanted to share with you because I think you, you'll find it interesting with regard to this topic that we're, we're discussing. So we are living in a time when we are more distracted than ever. Agreed? We have, uh, I don't have mine on me, but in my briefcase there, I've got my cell phone, right? We've got the cell phone. We've got 
technology has things coming at us all the time, even when we're driving in our cars. We can flip something on, we can go and look up on, the, on TV, the internet, the computer, our phones. It's constant, more than ever, and particularly the young children. They get into it at a very, very young age, it's starting to be a, kind of addicted here. And the research that they, that they did is, is cited in this book, and she says that, that um, they found, this is really interesting, um, well, let me back up a little bit. Most of us, I won't have you raise your hand, but I want you to just answer inside your head how you feel about being bored, right? Not many people say, I can't wait to get home because I got a session of boredom that I'm going to set in on. It's just, man. I've scheduled 30 minutes of boredom. It's amazing, you know, and after that, I got to eat and watch TV, but oh, that boredom, woo, can't wait. Um, now, when I'm done with this, you may say, I think I will. I think I will schedule some boredom because here's what they found. They found that the part of your brain, they did this on, on, you know, studying brain scans and so forth, the part of your brain that is creative, right, and is coming up with ideas and inventing things and solving problems, and mostly the creative part where you're, you're, you're using that imagination to come up with things, that part of your brain is suppressed, highly suppressed, when you are being stimulated by watching a movie or being active with a, an argument about politics or, you know, any of the things that we are, you know, watching TikTok, going from one TikTok to the other, a lot of tiny kids are already doing that. Just your brain is stimulated, 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 stimulated. A lot of it is just pure nonsense. It may not even be bad of itself, but it's sheer nonsense, hours of hours of nonsense. But what they found was the creative part of your brain, it starts to go down, down, down. It is, it is suppressed. And that when you get in a state of boredom, which we shun like the plague, but if you actually are in that state, that is the time that the part of your brain that is creative begins to fire. It's at its peak. And most people don't realize that. They say, well, I, I got to have music or TV or something to, to get me. No, actually, you don't. If you are doing something that you find, let's say you're in the waiting room. And now that we've invented uh, smartphones, what's the first thing we do when we're sitting in the waiting room? <laughs> yeah. What she says is that if you actually allow times like that that are boring to become boring, they actually won't be. What you'll find is your brain starts to think about things that you didn't think about, and you'll start getting solutions to things. She said, why do you think when you're in the shower, oftentimes that's when you get some really great ideas? Because in the shower, it's very menial, right? You've done it thousands of times. Okay, water, come down on me. Okay, I went, and then you're not really doing much with your brain, and so your brain is, whoa, starting to solve problems. And so a lot of times when we're lying in bed, right, and we're just awake, or we're driving, or we're in a waiting room, think about what would happen if you combined what the science says about this and what the scripture says about prayer. And you said, I'm going to have no outside stimulus hitting me, but I am going to allow my brain to just relax in this, in this state of boredom when the creative part and the problem solving and the real, the real you know, intense thoughts of things that you want to deal with are rising to the front and then you're meditating on God's word at the same time. Or you're just thinking about God. You're not even reading the Bible at this point. You read the Bible, you've got and now is your time to say, I just want to have quiet time. And guess what? That part of your brain will start to do the work. You don't have to do it. You are wired so that when you have that quiet time, that part of your brain starts to fire up. And so I want you to think about that with regard to what do I do with prayer? Because I'm struggling with prayer, Carl. You're still not answering that question. Oh, we're getting there. So we want to get practical. Let's get practical. I'm going to share with you something that I have done for years, and I never really put this into a presentation for the longest time until earlier this year. I decided, you know, this has really helped me. I think I want to share that with regard to, to prayer. There are many ways that you can pray. I'm not at all saying this is the way. Um, Jesus gave us an example. He said, when you pray, pray this way. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm really taking biblical principles and I'm using this as sort of a jump start to help you have a better prayer life. Once you're in that communion with God, God, God and you will decide where that goes, right? But I want to share with you something that I have found to be very, very helpful for me. And I call it the joy prayer. Another thing I call it, just 
is the antenna prayer. And the reason I use the antenna is because you're sitting in a waiting room, right? You've only got a few minutes. You can sh shoot up an antenna and go through this prayer with God quickly. And this is not a, like, here's the words you say type of thing. It's more of some topics that we're going to look at. You hit the J, the O, the Y, and, and you allow that to happen either quickly in a waiting room in two minutes, or I've done it when I'm, I'm, lay, I'm lying in bed and I want to talk to God. And this just this kind of gets me through the areas that God says are important. And so let's take a look at these. Um, this also brings balance. Um, this is something I do to, to the managers that I train at work, um, at, at the company I work for. I put my hands up like this, and I tell these, all these new managers, right? They're like happy puppies. Oh, I'm going to be great. I'm going to be great. I'm going to be great. And I'll, we'll get into all the training of, you know, the things they have to know about budgeting and all that. And I'll say, now, this is perfection right here. And I say, some of you are going to be a, a little bit more about, you go by the book, it's about the process, it's about the policy, and you're going to be kind of strict on people, and it's like, well, you know, if you want some, someone to love you, go home to your mama, because I ain't her, right? I'm here, to, I'm here to get the product out the door. That's, that's, that's you. Others of you are over here, where you're a little bit easy on those things, but you're very much a people person. Right? You're very much a people person. It's all about the people. You want your people to have a good relationship with you and like you. And I said, so, so some of you are here. Hopefully none of you are here. Right? We wouldn't have selected you as a manager. And some of you are here. Hopefully none are here. Or you'd be a doormat. Right? And everybody would walk over you. And you couldn't be a manager. I said, but guess what? None of you are here. Not one of you is here. You're all, you're all struggling with something that pushes you a little bit one way or the other. And I said, your job is to understand what, where is your default, and you shore up the other side. You're always moving, right? You're moving toward perfection. And the same thing with our spiritual walk with God. If we took this church right here, we would see that we all have certain strengths and weaknesses, but some of those get us out of balance, right? And if you have different personality type than your spouse, and you go traveling, you're quick to notice that in them, right? The things they have out. Uh, yours, you are this, but they're, you know, a little bit too this. You, you've got it figured out. And so when we go through this, I want you to see the balance that this brings with yourself. It's almost like you're, you're allowing God to recalibrate you, and it's so simple to do. So let's start with the J. Well, let me just back up. So J-O-Y. The joy, when I, ha when I you know, go into this, I want to talk, talk about what is the relationship I have with Jesus? And what this says is whether you're new to praying or whether you've done it for 20 years, you're going to start to be thinking about something that's important to God, a relationship. The O is for my relationship with others, right? The Bible has a lot to say about how we treat others. As you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. So God cares greatly about how we treat each other. And finally, your relationship with yourself and that how do I view myself? Do I have blind spots here? Do I think I'm, I'm this? Do I think I'm that? We're going to look at that as well. So the first one, the J, Jesus, focusing on relationship with Jesus. So on each of these, I, per, I try to go two sides of a coin, so that balance. The first one is my seeking of Jesus. So am I seek? I just, I, as I shoot up to prayer, how am I doing on seeking Jesus? And the other side of it is how am I doing on receiving Jesus? Seeking Jesus, ask and it shall be given to you, seek and ye shall find these two things. So how am I doing with seeking Jesus? And so there are, I shared this last night, and I'm not going to get into as much detail here, but I just want, I just want to, I've got a resource for you after the, after when you get home, you can check this out. I only shared five things, but seeking God is an amazing, an amazing thing to undertake. You can do it through prayer. You can do it through um, Bible study. But most of us don't have a clue of all the things waiting for us if we seek God. If I ask even Christians that have been Christians for years, I want you to list, you know, if I said list, list 50 movies that, are, that have been made in the United States and shown, you could probably do it. If I said list 50 things the Bible says about what happens when you seek God, ah, we would, we would struggle. So I'm just sharing five. There's a whole lot more. When I throw up that prayer and, and, and I send it up and I'm, I'm meditating on, on God and my relationship with Jesus, am I seeking God? Here are some benefits of, or some facts about seeking God. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, verse 5, that I will under, they that seek the Lord understand all things. 
Do we believe it? How about this one? They that seek the Lord, Psalm 69, 69 verse 6. They that seek the Lord shall not be confounded. I'd kind of like that one, right? How many of you like to walk around in a daze, confounded by everything? I never get any hands raised for that one. How about this? 2 Chronicles 14, 7. They that seek the Lord will have rest. Rest, physical and spiritual and mental and emotional rest. How about this one? Fear. You have fear over your job situation or your relationships or so many things. We have fear. The Bible says they that seek the Lord will be delivered from fear. And finally, Psalm 14, verse 2 says that when God looks over all the earth, he's looking for one activity. It's not, I want to see who's obedient. It's not, I want to see who loves me. It's, I want to see who's seeking me. Who is seeking me? So it's important. So I focus on that. And if you want to get all, there's over, there's over uh, I think there's over 100 verses. There's 55 categories, not 55 verses. There's a lot more than that. If you go to my website, gotforgod.com, and you click on a tab called Resources, you'll get the list of all the Bible texts. And it's, it's, we saw five. There's 55 different things. And so that was the, that's the seeking part. The receiving part, this is the only one that I'm going to give as homework. I have something for you to do. No, I won't be able to check your work, so you're free to slack off if you don't want to. But if you look up, you get out of concordance, or you can go to a website like BibleGateway.com or BibleHub.com, and you look up all the times that the word receive, receiving, or if your translation is King James, receiveth, you look that up. When you're done with your study, you will be amazed. That's all I'll say. I'm actually preparing a talk on that. But this is the most understudied word, I think, that we have. Receive. What happens? How do we receive? What's going on with that whole receiving Christ? It's, it's far more than you imagine. Go look the word up in all of its places it occurs. But the point of that is that when, you, when I'm starting this prayer, this antenna prayer, this quick J-O-Y, I'm thinking about how am I doing on seeking God and how am I doing on receiving God, and it gives me ideas it makes my, my seeking and my receiving come alive more, and it's something I'm not skipping over. You remember the verse that we talked about last night. They that come to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And some of us look at our own lives and go, I'm not really seeking him. This prayer will help with that, I promise you. So then we move to the O, others. Jesus first, others next, yourself last, joy. The Bible says, in, Jesus said in the Bible, in Matthew 10, 16, and this was advice to his, his disciples and to us, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So you have a nexus between the two. They connect. I have a whole series on this that I did with regard to our interpersonal skills uh, with other people. As Christians, we need to be good at this. Amen? God wants us to. We do not want to be. Well, we have the truth, and you better listen or else. I'm going to show you, and we start arguing, and that's not, that's not godly. That's not what God wants. So we need both the serpent and the dove. So if we don't combine them, just a quick, a quick um, and I'll give you the, the, how you can get those talks on that. If we are all about the wisdom of the serpent, but we leave off the harmlessness of the dove, we're going to be harsh. And some of us, with harshness, we're here as, as Christians. Some of us, ee, I hate to say it, but might be, right? You know, we get, we get into those debates, we get into arguments, and, and oh, we're not representing the spirit very well. We're getting just the, the doctrine. And others of us are so much dove, but not much wisdom of how do I share or when do I share. And so if the dove is more of a, well, I know I should say something. You know, there's a board meeting, and there's about to be a decision that I, I know that's not right. We shouldn't be, but oh, they'll think. I think I'm a stick in the mud, so but whatever. And we don't have the wisdom of the serpent. We just, everything's about pleasing people. And we're too far this way. And so when I get to the O, I'm thinking, how have I done with this? And I, I think back on my day. This morning, when I got impatient with my wife, I'm going to go apologize. Shouldn't have done that. Hey, the other day, I should have spoken up. I should have spoken up right there. And give, it gives me balance. See what we're doing here? We want balance in all things, and God says, none of you have it. There's not one of you that has balance. That's why we need him. Amen? 
Isn't it great that we have something that gives us constant need of God, that we genetically are not this, but we can be doing this, right? We can be saying, Lord, help me. And so when I think about this one, it's all about my relationships with others. And God then has a chance to say, Carl, you've got blind spots. You thought you handled that thing just right. Here's something I noticed. I go, that's right. So it gives me that balance. If you want to see that series on interpersonal skills for Christians, it's called conversingwithserpentsanddoves.com. That's another book I'm working on, conversingwithserpentsanddoves.com. And you can see what the Bible and what science has to say about our interactions with others. Am I wise as serpents and harmless as doves in my interaction with others? All right. And then we get to the why, the, the letter Y is yourself. And this one, now, you can put any verses in here you want. You can even not do any of the things I'm suggesting here. This is just to help you jumpstart and keep, I mean, I've been doing it for years, so it's not a, just a jumpstart for me. I do this when I lay my head down. I have my you know, regular formal prayer, but when I find myself with that brilliance of boredom that the book talks about, I'm like, now's the time to commune with God. So here's what I do with the why. This is just me but it's getting that both sides of that coin because I think balance is the key to almost every problem we have in life. Something done with the best of intentions pushed too far can be a bad thing, right? You think about that. It's true in leadership. It's true in the church. If I push something good too far, I hound you on a doctrine I think you need to understand, but I keep doing it over and over, and I keep now I'm pushing it too far. So the first side of the coin, do I believe that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Do I believe that? I ask myself that. Well, I got this thing coming up, this project, this is, oh, I, I don't know if I can get through this. What? God says, well, I told you that I can give you strength through all things. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so an example of where this didn't happen, we, our, our example on both sides of the coin is going to come from the Israelites here. So in, in uh, the story of the Israelites... Just Are we just on the edge of the promised land right now, on planet Earth? Are we, as Christians, do we believe that we're, on the, we're right about to enter the promised land, that Jesus is coming soon? Yes. We have a parallel here. So we're going to go into the land, and Moses gets 12 spies. He says, go spy out the land of Canaan and see what it looks like and come back and give us a report. Now, when they went into that land of Canaan, Ten of them had a mindset of the world, and two of them had a mindset, the mind of Christ. So when they went in there, they saw that the men were giants. The fruits, the grapes were so large, they had to carry them two men on a stick to hold them up. But the men themselves were giants. These were warriors. These were soldiers. And the Israelites were just, just came out of slavery. And when they came back, and, and they said, we have a report to give you, Caleb and Joshua looked to the promises of God to have victory over the Canaanites through them, and the other ten spies looked at the physical superiority of the others and said, we can't do it. We can't do it. Now, this is a trick question. Were they right that they couldn't do it? Yes and no. <laughs> right? Yes, they couldn't do it, but if God says, I'll give you the victory, he would come through them. I mean, we have an angel in the Bible. One angel wiped out 180,000 soldiers. I think God has countless angels he could handle, the, the Canaanites. For God, that's literally nothing. But, but to the ten spies, oh, we can't do it. We can't do it. Have you heard that in the church today? We can't do it. We, this sin, it's just got me. I can't overcome. And you shouldn't even be saying I should overcome. Really? You want to hang on to that sin? Well, God says that he can give you victory even in that sin. Even that one you're thinking of right now, that, oh, I can't. No, you can't, but he can. Amen? This is the balance. This is the balance that we're talking about. Now, I won't dwell on it for time, but do you remember what happened to those ten spies? God said, Moses, they have, they have grumbled against me so many times that I'll tell you what, they say that, that I brought them out here to die in the wilderness and all that. He says, tell the, tell the, uh, tell the children of Israel that I, I'm not with them and I will not go up into battle with them because they have said that I will not give them victory and exactly what they said now will happen. So turn them around 
And now they've got 40 years. They will do just what they said. Because they doubted my word, they will all die in the wilderness. But their children will go through. Suddenly when they heard that, we can do it. <laughs> we can do it. Get, get your swords together. No, Moses. No, we're not going back out. And Moses said, well, you can go, but the Lord's not with you. Well, we're going. We're going. See how see, see the, the, both errors in one thing. I, can, I can't do it with Christ. Well, now I'll do it even without him. Absolutely both errors. And so the Bible says that the, when the men of Israel went up to fight the Canaanites, they had a great slaughter, and they came back defeated. And they had to wander around for 40 long years until every one of them died. But not Caleb and Joshua. Not Caleb and Joshua. Do you remember when the man came to Jesus and said, please heal my daughter, she's, she's dying. And Jesus asked him a question. He says, do you believe that I can do this? And the man gave the most balanced answer you can possibly give. And I want you to remember this in prayer. He didn't say, of course I believe, heal her. And he didn't say, no, I don't believe, I wish I could. He said, yes, I believe. And then he added this, help thou mine unbelief. When you're in prayer, do not go to God and say, you can't make this happen. Say, God, your word, I just read in your word where it said this promise. I'm struggling here. It seems impossible. I've got all these reasons but I do believe, Lord, now can you help my own belief? And God says, that's all I need. And he'll start to transform your faith in that prayer. Now, what about the other side of the coin? So we said, do I believe that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? The other side of that coin is, do I realize that without Christ, I can do nothing? John 15, verse 5. This is what we're striving for. And so many of us go through our Christian walk like this, or like this. And folks, I hate to say it, but I'll say it. We've got books written by scholars that promote this and this. And they are read by millions, and amen is said in all the wrong places. Because they believe one error that, uh, I'll just have to cling to this sin until Jesus comes, or if I try hard enough and grit my teeth, this is what God says. And that's why the Bible says, that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. In fact, it says to the natural man, they are foolishness. The idea that I can have a miracle happen in me, perfect balance. And God says, in this prayer, I'm going to move you into perfect balance so that you can start to see miracles. Are you ready for miracles in your life? Are you going to see miracles in the final days that are going to shock the world? And we've got to be ready for that. And this is the balance that we're after. Now, there was one other that didn't go into the land of Canaan that you would think would have, right? And that was Moses. Now, Moses had always been faithful to God, but he had a couple little slip-ups. And one of them was when God had told Moses, do you remember the first time, strike the rock and I'll bring forth water? The second time he said, just speak to it. And, and the children of Israel were a, stick, a stiff-necked people, you know, and they were going on about how unfair everything was. And so Moses had had, had enough. And Moses, when God said, speak to the rock, I'll, I'll bring forth what Moses struck the rock. And he said what? Must I fetch the water for you people? Mm. Moses forgot that it was all God. In his anger, he said, must I get the water for you people? God honored it and made the water flow, but later on, that's a problem. And so when you have this prayer, you're going to be calibrated daily in these areas of, I can have victory through Christ, but it's not me who does it. Amen? What a perfect balance. What a perfect balance that we have there. So, J-O-Y, Jesus first. How am I doing on seeking Jesus and receiving him? Others next, am I being wise and also harmless in my interaction? Am I avoiding the, the problem of being a doormat or a steamroller? Because a lot of us don't realize when we go to steamroller mode, and we got to have our way, because we're right. And we also don't realize when we go to the doormat mode, and we cave and we capitulate, when we should have spoken up and said something. And when we speak up, guess what we need? We need this balance. That is supernatural, brothers and sisters. You don't have it. You could take every course that I teach in corporate America on interpersonal skills, and without Christ, 
you don't have it. You naturally are out of balance. And I'm glad that I'm out of balance because it causes me to seek God constantly. And it causes me to pray without ceasing. So, the Bible says three times a day is a good idea. In Psalm 55, 17, David says, evening, morning, and noon do I come before thee in prayer. Evening, morning, and noon, three times. In Daniel 6, 10, it talks about Daniel. We know how God used Daniel. We saw God use David in amazing ways. We saw how God used Daniel in amazing ways. Daniel was asleep in there with the lions. Didn't bother him. He knew God had control. And Daniel, it says, would kneel down and pray three times a day. So I started doing that. I started, you know, that's what I'm going to do. In the morning, I'll have a, a, a much more uh, longer prayer, a much uh, more uh, sharing and, and intense prayer where I'm really pouring out things with God. At noon, I may not have time to, to do that. There's where my antenna prayer comes up. It's been five minutes talking to God quickly, covering these areas, and then at night, another prayer. But pray without ceasing all through the day. So I book into this prayer. One last thing I'll say about this before we wrap this up. I book into this prayer, J-O-Y, by starting with gratitude to God. That's the first thing I do. I just The first thought out of my mind is, Lord, Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And the Bible says to be grateful even in trials. Thank you for the trials I'm going through. Thank you for these problems because I know it's refining me. The series is on uh, discipleship, right? Discipleship for the Lord, the discipline that God, that God uh, gives us, refining us in the fire. Thankful for those things. So I, the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 16, 34, to, to be grateful. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, in all circumstances. And then at the, on the, at the end of it, after I've gone through the joy, I claim God's promises for my future. I say, thank you, Lord, that tomorrow is going to be great, and the next day is going to be great. And I got a great week and month and year coming up because the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, I know my thoughts that I have toward you. I know my plans that I have toward you. And it is to have peace and also an expected end. What is, it? What is an expected end? Another way of saying that is what? An expected end. Hope. You, you can see. I know it's dark. You can see what's coming. Light at the end of that tunnel. And so what you see here, just as with our other two topics, this covers God's character gratitude over God for all that he does, God's will, J-O-Y, and God's promises, claiming them at the end of the prayer. This prayer can take one minute or one hour. Totally up to you. You can change the verses. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to do any of this. But I'm telling you now, as a testimony, it works, and it has helped me a lot to be balanced. So you can have joy every day, every day, J-O-Y, the J-O-Y prayer. I wanted to say a couple things about the waiting prayer. And this comes again from Andrew Murray. He said something I thought was really great in his book about uh, waiting on God is the name of another one of his little pocket books. He says that oftentimes when we ask God for something that we really need to happen, he doesn't answer it right away and we get frustrated. And he says, and so what God is doing with us is he's working with us so that the goal here, now watch this closely, is that as we're waiting on God, because we're praying for that thing, our time with God, because of that thing, is causing us to have our prayers now and our presence of God, presence with God, become more valuable to us than the thing that we're asking for. Because all of that patience that had its perfect work, James 1, 4, has been working on us. And so we gradually get to the place where God is more valuable than the thing that we're even praying for, and we're willing to accept whatever he says. That's a transformation that has to take place in our minds, and it doesn't happen overnight. It also helps to have a prayer partner. Think about having a prayer partner. I had a friend of mine that was going through a rough time. He said, can we pray every night at a certain time? At first I was like, ah, you know, I've got other things. I can, this is going to really tie up. And I, but I was, I was like, no, let's do that. And did you know that went on for years? And during that time, I could feel that it was making a difference in my daily walk with God, in my interaction with others. The Bible says in John 10, 27, it quotes where Jesus is talking about his sheep, and you and I are his sheep. And he says, my sheep hear my voice, 
and I know them. I know them, and they follow me. Now, most of you probably don't know much about herding sheep, and I don't either, but one of the things that a shepherd who gave insights on all of this said one time, a modern shepherd said that sheep get very familiar with the shepherd's voice, right? Kind of like your dog gets familiar with how you look, how you smell. Sheep get familiar with the shepherd's voice, and they can tell, and they know that voice. My sheep hear my voice, and I know him. How do you think you and I are going to get familiar with God for not spending time with him in prayer and in the word? That way, at the end of time, when all the deceptions and delusions that come on planet Earth, we will know the difference because we recognize him and not a counterfeit. Amen? If you're praying for others, I want to end it on this right here. I want to give you hope. I want to end with some very, very positive information here about George Mueller. We talked about him a little bit ago. This wraps it up. George Mueller, as I said, was a man who was known for being a great man of prayer. He was lived in the 1800s, and he decided, he wrote in one of his, one of his um, writings that he had, he had picked out five individuals that were really going through some trouble. They were kind of rebellious. Uh, some of them were his friend's kids, and he picked out five of them, and he said, I see where they're struggling. I'm going to pray that God convert all five of these, right? This was in 1844 is when he did this. I'm going to pray that, God, you will convert these boys' hearts so that they will give their lives to you. He prayed every day, and he kept praying, and he kept praying. And I know some of you, I know some of you have relatives that you're praying for. You want them to be in the kingdom. He said, I'm committed to this. And he prayed every day, and he prayed every day. In 18 months, finally, 18 months later, one of them was converted and gave their heart to the Lord. He said, oh, I thank God for that, but I'll keep praying for the other four. He kept praying, and he kept praying. Five years later, the second one gave their heart to the Lord. He was thankful for that. He kept praying, and he kept praying. Six more years passed until the third one, and Mueller kept praying. These were rebellious kids, too. He kept praying, and he kept praying, and he kept praying. After 36 years of this, there were still two more left that had not been converted. And Mueller wrote, well, I've, I've prayed for them now for 36 years, and I will continue to pray for them in the hopes that maybe after I'm gone, they'll be converted. And finally, Mueller did pass away, and the other two 52 years later, 52 years later, the last two finally gave their hearts to the Lord. And Mueller believed the verse that says, pray always and don't lose heart, because God hears our prayers, amen? God hears our prayers. So, if you want to have a good prayer life, a fulfilling prayer life, and a walk with God, let's start it now with actually having some prayer. So those of you who are able, please kneel as we close. Dear Lord, it's amazing that we can come to you just by getting on our knees and talking to you. That you will never leave us or forsake us. You are here for us. And Lord, we ask you right now for forgiveness where we have not taken advantage of prayer. And Lord, we struggle, and you know we struggle, and I thank you so much that you're a God of mercy and you're a God of forgiveness. But I ask you to just forgive us. Open our eyes to our need of you, because if we understand our need of you, Lord, we won't forget you. Lord, I'm guessing that no one in here very often forgets their cell phone when they leave the house. And if they do, they probably go back for it. How often do we forget you, Father? Please help us to cherish you more than we do our cell phones. Cherish you more than we do our jobs, more than our health, more than anything else in this world. Because, Lord, if we do that, we'll commune with you, and we will seek you. And when we do that, we'll have a walk with you like Enoch, and maybe, Lord, we'll be able to be alive when your Son comes in those clouds. That's in your hands, Father. But for that group that's alive, when you send your Son, we know that we will hear, hey, you're closer to my house now than you are to yours, just like with Enoch. Why don't you come home with me? This is our prayer, Father. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us stand and respond with hymn number 612, Onward Christian Soldiers. heaven again we thank you for so many blessings and we thank you for the opportunity that we have for a new start an absolute new start lord where our slate is wiped clean and we can have that fulfilling walk with you we can experience it we can tell others about it and lord we just thank you so much that you bless us every day in jesus name we pray amen